All right, CNT 125, Chapter 8, we're in the section where we start talking VLANs. Uh, before they talk VLANs, they remind us real quickly, subnets that we got done talking about earlier is a group of IP addresses that are, uh, I should say a subnet is really a group of IP addresses, a block of IP addresses. And the reason we do that is to take a large network and start breaking into smaller pieces. And this is accomplished by adding things like a router or layer three switch. And each of those layer three switch or router ports is going to be a chunk of the network, a subnet of the network. So therefore, they're going to get allocated their own IP address space or own IP address pool, if you will, own chunk of the whole IP address network, a subnet. Um, so as we think back to what we did before, zero subnet, 32 subnet, 64 subnet, um, each of these router ports, each of these chunks of the network are a subnet and have their own IP address pool. Well, with subnetting, that is kind of a layer three solution by breaking the IP address pool up into pieces and implementing that with something layer three. Uh, that's what subnetting is. VLANs are when I take a group of ports on a layer two switch, group them together, and they're now logically a group and act like a small network within the larger network. And what you're doing is when you grab those ports on layer two switch and pull them together into a little little piece of the, the larger network, you're forcing some of that local traffic to go to a router before it can go anywhere else. So it's almost like you're creating that little subnet inside of the switch, uh, but VLANs are actually layer two. You actually configure them in the switch by taking groups of ports and saying these ports are VLAN one, these ports are VLAN two. And for traffic to leave VLAN one, you actually need to get to a router. The router would have enough smarts to say, yes, I'll talk, let you talk to layer uh, VLAN two, or no, you wrote a, there's a rule in here that says, no, I can't let you two talk for some reason. Uh, that's what a VLAN really is, and that's going to, again, break your traffic up uh, at layer two that nodes plugged into the same switch cannot actually talk to each other. Um, that's a layer two solution. So instead of placing routers on every floor, they say, okay, you know, we go back to that first picture where we have switch, 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 and only one router for the whole building. They say, you know what? We're going to take a handful of computers on this switch, handful of computers in this switch, handful of computers in this switch, and there are going to be part of some uh, department VLAN, whether it be management or manufacturing or administration or wireless or wired or IP phone or whatever. I take a handful of these nodes on each floor and each switch and I can configure them into a logical network called a virtual local area network. Um, and it's going to do the exact same thing as what we had here. Same kind of concept of breaking my network into pieces but using less routers in my overall scheme. That's what I can do with a VLAN. So it's a kind of a layer two solution on the same lines of what I was doing with my subnetting. So, a, a VLAN, I'm going to logically separate the network, but I'm going to do it in layer two on switches. And those ports on the switches that I group together are going to be their own little broadcast domain, own little miniature network within the whole. VLANs are implemented on the switch. I can either do it by port on the switch, or I can do it, the book doesn't talk about this, I can actually do it by MAC address as well. I can actually have a MAC address uh, be assigned to a certain VLAN. That allows things that might move around my network when it plugs into a new spot in the network, it still gets assigned to the same VLAN. So somebody picks up their office and, and moves down the hall, they take their computer and uh, phone down the hall and plug it in, that phone is still going to be in the phone VLAN, even though it's in a different switch port, if you will. That can be done by MAC address. It does take a special uh, switch management software on the back end to do this. I almost need like a database of uh, MAC addresses for it to reference. That's the idea behind it. Um, but anytime that MAC address pops up, it's like, oh, you're over here now? Okay, well, you're still a phone, and you're still on the phone VLAN, so have a good day. Um, it allows you to do it dynamically. In the lab, we're going to do a port by statically, because that's what we have available to us. Uh, but just recognize that you could do it by MAC address. I could do it dynamically. 
So let's take a simple example of this and start thinking about, okay, why would I go to the trouble doing this uh, a VLAN thing? So let's say I have this type of network environment where I have a switch and I have a couple different types of things plugged into it. Desktop users, uh, IP phones, and wireless users all into the same switch, which is not uncommon at all. It actually happens in most of our hack buildings, if you will, all those things plugged into the same switch. Well, if I wanted to separate them out and keep their traffic separate from each other for security reasons, for traffic reasons, for filtering reasons, whatever you want to call it, I could do this. I could do like the book showed you early on in the chapter, a router on each floor, or I do a separate switch for each one and a separate switch plugs into a different router port. I could do that um, and it would work and we get the job done. I do have some problems with that because not all routers have that many ports um, and I am adding a lot of extra gear to get the job done. So I, I could do it, but it may not be the best solution. Well, I can accomplish the same thing by on my switch, I take the handful of ports for the desktop users and I configure them to be VLAN 10, if you will. I take the IP phones plugged in and configure them as VLAN 20. I take the access points and the wireless users those ports and plug them into VLAN 30. And I then program the switch to recognize those three VLANs and I pass that traffic to the router. I had not, I didn't put it in the map, so I had to add it later. Sorry. I put it into the router. Um, so now the router understands these VLANs exist and I can write rules in the router to say, yes, let them communicate or no, don't let them communicate. I can do that. The router's smart enough to allow those rules to occur. That is going to get the same job done as this, but with less equipment. So this becomes a lot more normal than this. Okay, that would be one of the reasons we do VLANs. Um, and here I actually delineate some of the things we've already said for us. It's going to isolate heavy and unpredictable traffic. Yep, voice over IP. Uh, I can identify groups of devices whose data should be given priority. Industrial control, turning pumps and things on and off for power generation or, or, or water pumping, that sort of thing, really important things. I can contain a group of devices that work on legacy protocols, older uh, protocols, older control equipment. Uh, I can separate, separate out groups of users who need special or limited security, maybe a guest network. I can configure a temporary network for a short-term project. Uh, they're only here for a month or two doing uh, you know, consulting work. As soon as they're done, they're out of there. I can give it a little VLAN that they're quarantined off. Uh, and this can also reduce the cost of network equipment, as I was just showing you. That's the example I was showing you right here of like, I could get the job done with that, but I could do it with this with just a lot less equipment. I can get the same thing done as long as there's enough space on my switch to do that. Um, they don't come right out and mention, but here's some advantages of VLANs. It is flexible. I can do ports from different switches and still group them into the same VLAN. I can do that. So it's flexible across my whole building. I can use any type of node, whether it be PC, IP, phone, wireless access point, whatever, and group it into a specific VLAN. I have less uh, physical equipment needs, as I showed you, uh, less switches, less routers kind of thing. And there is broadcast and security in that when I when I put the VLANs in. I can secure things out. Uh, I can secure things and I can kind of quarantine things, uh, quarantine things with broadcast domains. Disadvantages, it is additional configuration. It is additional things that I can get wrong, too. More times than not, I need a layer three device that I'm going to connect my switch to so that I could either permit or deny what's called inter VLAN traffic, uh, communication between two different VLANs. I need a layer three to get the job done on that one. And it is also prone to VLAN hopping attacks, which they mentioned at the end of the chapter for you. Uh, so that is one of the disadvantages of VLANs. My VLANs are going to get handled by what are called managed switches. Uh, the first thing to remind us of is unmanaged switches. Unmanaged switch would be the kind of switch you'd probably have for your house. It's unmanaged, it's simply plug and play. I plug my devices in, it just starts passing data back and forth. I don't have any really any configuration on it. I don't really have any IP address on it for management. It's not expensive. Uh, expensive. It's not expensive. It's not configurable. Uh, it's very limited. It can't support VLANs. That'd be the kind of thing I have at my house or maybe at a super small business, You know, maybe like a church or something like that. Really can't do a whole heck of a lot cost effective. Meanwhile, in a place like a school or a business, they're going to use a managed switch because the managed switch has a lot more capability. 
a managed switch, I actually can configure it via command line, actually connecting to it like we did the routers. We plugged putty into it and ran commands to configure it. I can do the same thing on a switch. Or I can do it sometimes by browsing in by GUI, uh, using my browser and browsing into it and clicking buttons and saying, yes, do this, no, don't do that. Sometimes the switches can be configured in groups. I can actually configure them using VTP, which we'll talk about later, where I can make one the uh, server switch, if you will. All the other switches, clients. All the other switch, client switches pick up their config from the server. That can be done. Um, I usually assign an IP address to the switch for management purposes. That way I can browse to it. I can remote access to it. I can telnet to it. I can SSH to it. Uh, and I can work on it remotely. Um, VMANs can be implemented through managed switches whose ports are partitioned into groups. Absolutely. Uh, and that's the reason we're going to use managed switches. Those are the only ones that I can actually put configuration on and or VLANs on. Uh, that's why they mention that right after I mentioned uh, VLANs with you. Here's configuring with a GUI, browsing in, using some tabs, clicking some buttons. Yay. Um, or I can do configuration through command line, which is what we'll end up doing in the lab. And when I do my managed switch, I off, uh, managed switch, I often tend to take, hey, this port is in this VLAN, these ports are in this VLAN, this port's in this VLAN, and so forth. Uh, that's what I tend to do, whether it be by GUI or running commands to get the job done. Switches are layer two. By sorting traffic based on layer two information, VLANs can actually create two more broadcast domains from a single broadcast domain. Absolutely. So, uh, for a normal layer two switch, uh, the normal layer two switch, the, it's going to manage the traffic on the LAN, um, and it's going to communicate from one um, host to another. So normally if I have a workstation here, I send traffic, the switch knows where to go to it and sends it here. So if I'm just in my LAN, the switch is going to process it all. If it needs to get to another network, the switch is going to pass the traffic to the router, and the router is going to process it and move it on to another network. That's normal layer two switch operation. If I have VLANs in play, what's going to happen now is if I have traffic, if I have a workstation here in VLAN 1 and it wants to send traffic to another workstation that's in VLAN 1 as well, the switch will just process it and pass computer to computer done. Easy peasy. Same thing on VLAN 2. I have a node here on VLAN 2, wants to talk to somebody else in VLAN 2, the switch will process it away it comes back. If it needs to go to the other VLAN, if VLAN 1 computer here needs to send traffic to VLAN 2, the switch can't process it. The switch is not intelligent enough. So what ends up happening is the VLAN 1 traffic hits the switch. The switch passes the router saying, hey, I hope you know. And the router's like, okay, I know. I'm configured. I understand. I will pass the traffic back here. The switch goes, oh, okay. And I'll pass it over here to VLAN 2. And that is what we would call inner VLAN routing, or they sometimes call it ROAS, router on a stick. Uh, sometimes you hear that name, router on a stick. Um, we are actually going to do this in the lab as well. Once we get our VLANs up and running, we're going to add a router in and let the router do the inter-VLAN routing, traffic in between VLANs. It's going to do that for us. But I need that layer 3 to have it happen. I can have ports assigned to VLAN 1, ports assigned to VLAN 2, and I can have them scattered all over the switch. It doesn't matter. That's why that's why these are called logical. Virtual local area networks is virtual. It's logical. They don't need to be all these ports here and then only these ports here. They can be scattered throughout the switch. Okay, And as long as I identify them, the switch will know, okay, I will let these ports here talk to these ports here, all VLAN 1. To identify what VLAN traffic belongs to, it's going to use frame tags. Um, IEEE 802.1Q is a standard that identifies frame tagging or VLAN tagging. Um, you're also going to hear this sometimes referred to as .1Q. IEEE 802.1Q, that's where the name comes from. So any traffic uh, getting to the switch and then leaving the switch, the switch is going to tag it as saying, hey, this came from VLAN 1, in case you need to process it, and when it gets to the router, the router would know what to do with that. So I almost think of it as like a luggage tag. Um, when I get to the airport, my, my luggage gets tagged so everybody knows how to handle it to get it to my destination. Uh, the same thing happens with VLAN traffic. A tag gets placed on it so it knows how to process it. Here's my normal Ethernet frame. Here's that VLAN tag getting shoehorned in there. So now all the switch ports know how to process that. And it's going to say, yes, go ahead and pass it out that port. It's in that VLAN. Or no, you can't pass it out that port. That's not the right VLAN. Don't do it. 
and that's how we know uh, what traffic belongs to what VLAN. All right, uh, we're going to come back and continue VLANs on the next podcast.